Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. What happened at Marley Woods? Are we any closer to solving the UFO enigma than we were in the 1960s? Is the nature of UFOs changing? Well, hello there, and welcome to the uh, 442nd, or 449th, sorry my voice cracked, so that messed me up, uh, 49th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and those cool questions came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. So having spent the last two months on uh, subjects like suicide, zombies, and hell, uh, tonight we're returning to UFOs, which a lot of people are probably very, very excited about. Uh, but before we introduce our distinguished guest, let's take care of, of that Ever so popular, but endangered species are weekly paranormal contest. So last week's question was, in what country would you find the Romblon Triangle? Well, Bill LaBelle from Frankston, New South Wales, Australia, was the first to get the answer. The Philippines. The triangle supposedly lies in the province of Romblon, where a number of surface, surface vessels are alleged to have either mysteriously disappeared or fallen victim to disaster under unexplainable circumstances. I once had an acquaintance in the Philippine Coast Guard, and he said it was just that uh, vessel operators there were lousy drivers. Well, take your own choice. Alrighty, so uh, this week's question is, in what country did a UFO supposedly fly through a railway tunnel in March? So get that right, and win a copy of uh, your choice, well, a copy of your choice, uh, Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny, or Rhode Island, A Genial History, by both, by uh, both, by, by, my dad, Blah. So call us locally at 401-766-1240 or from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada at 800-449-1240. Again, locally, that's 401-766-1240. Well, I can't believe it's been two and a half years since Ted Phillips was last on the show, but he's with us tonight. Ted is director of the Center for Physical Trace Research, and he has been an independent UFO researcher for the last 49 years. Jeez, that's longer than I've been at this. Mm. I remember hearing a 1978 interview with the great Stanton Friedman, and he was praising Ted's work. Ted began investigating UFO reports in 1964. Ted, I was 11 years old, and was a research associate of Dr. J. Allen Hynek from 1968 until Hynek's death in 1986. It was at Hynek's suggestion that Ted subsequently specialized in physical traces associated with the UFO sightings and landings, and as far as we know, he has the largest UFO landings database on the planet. He was a member of a select team invited to meet at the United, with the United Nations Secretary General in New York, along with Hynek, Jacques Vallee, and astronaut Gordon Cooper. He is a reg- regular presenter at UFO conferences, conferences and has been seen on the History Channel and many other radio and television venues. All right, so Ted Phillips, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. Hi. So how are you doing this, this fine day, Ted? Well, I'm doing well. I uh, <clears throat> did overhear your uh, weather forecast. <laughs> <laughs> You're in Missouri, I, right? Yeah, South Missouri. And uh, I just carried uh, about an hour's worth of plants back outdoors. Uh, this is crazy stuff, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to New England, at least for the next hour. <laughs> So (laughs) speaking of crazy stuff, let's get on to our subject here. So where is Marley Woods, and what's that all about? Uh, The Marley Woods, I can't give you a specific location at the request of the uh, property owners. And uh, uh, I think they're a little reluctant to have their fences torn down and and so on, because a lot of people would like to uh, to get in there and experience some of this, and I wish they could. But uh, uh, I can tell you it's uh, in southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, and uh, quite some distance east of Branson, Missouri, where I live, and uh, that's about as close as I can get. Um, and <clears throat> when I was asked to go down there by the property owners 15 years ago. I can't imagine that. Um, I was actually kind of reluctant to go because it didn't involve uh, any, at that time, any physical evidence. And the uh, property owner, one of the property owners that called, uh, told me, he said, well, we do have 
video that we've been trying to take. So I took a shot, went down there, and 15 years later, I'm still there. And it's the only uh, it's the only place in almost 50 years that I've actually been able to see uh, devices that I can't explain. And uh, it um, <clears throat> the marvelous thing about the Marley Woods which is very similar to uh, Skinwalker Ranch hmm. uh, in the types of activities and so on. And as a matter of fact, if something new happens at Skinwalker, uh, there is a very good chance that it will be uh, repeated in the Marley Woods and a couple of other sites uh, at some point in the future. And uh, I don't understand why. And, um, you know, I've looked at at all aspects that I can think of uh, to try to see, well, is there something weird about this area? And uh, so far I've not been able to find out. You know, it's normal, very rural and isolated country. And uh, I do, uh, one of my main interests in Marley, and the Marley sightings have covered just about the... Uh, the entire spectrum of ufology, with the exception of uh, little guys. Uh, there have not been any humanoid reports, and uh, but just about everything else on the charts has taken place there. And uh, one of my truly main interests are the small light ball devices. And uh, uh, I've seen those uh, at a distance of 10 feet. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the team members and I were able to observe two of these things about a foot above the ground, watch the first one come in, and uh, uh, the thing dropped down within a foot of the ground and got uh, 32 minutes of high-def video. And uh, the the first object, what, what was so intriguing... I was watching through night vision, and uh, it was not a, a, a very bright uh, device at all. But uh, as I watched, I could see uh, protruding from a section of this, this light bulb uh, what looked like a uh, distension, which then popped into a second light bulb about the same size and same color and so on. And those two uh, remain stationary a foot or so above the ground uh, throughout the whole uh, 32 minutes. And uh, in the last 12 minutes of the observation, about 10 feet away from those, two more appeared, and they were actually resting on the ground. And uh, so that sort of stuff goes on. So, Ted, I assume these devices you're talking about did not originate in Missouri. (laughs) <laughs> in any normal sense of the word. I don't think so. <laughs> well, you know, this is this is utterly fascinating to us because, uh, and l- let me just explain for those who might not know what Skinwalker Ranch is. It's, a, it's an unidentified place in Utah. A, at least one book has been written about it that I know of. And if you listen to George Knapp on Coast to Coast AM in the in the evenings or early mornings, George is, was involved with that case. And um, it is one of a number of flap areas, and, and Ben and I have been... Lately, specializing, so to speak, in, fla- in, in, in flap areas, flaps being large numbers of paranormal events that may or may not be related, including UFOs and e- e- all the way down to Bigfoot ghosts, you name it, anything weird. Well, see, it's one of those areas where it's very hard to be specialized in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's <laughs> just so much stuff happens. And, and we were like at, uh, ex- yeah, well, that's it. So, everything. so Skinwalker Ranch is, is typical, uh, the, the Central Connecticut Triangle we've been working with since 05, at Rendlesham Forest, where we were in September, um, places of that kind, uh, Freetown State Forest in our area. And apparently we can add Marley Woods to that. Uh, would you call it a flap area? Have, have other things besides UFO activity uh, been recorded there? Yes, actually. Uh, and definitely. It, uh, uh, it's an area of um, almost continuous activity. Yeah. And um, I, I sincerely, after 15 years, believe if I was able to put something up uh, a thousand, two thousand feet that could uh, surveil 
the entire Marley area uh, on any given night. At some point, there would be activity. Yeah. And uh, there, of course, are uh, specific very hot spots inside of Marley, uh, which are highly reproductive in, uh, in activity. And that's the great thing about this. You know, all those years going in behind a landed UFO, and finding footprints, fingerprints, uh, landing gear imprints, physical evidence that something was there, I was always coming in after the fact. And traces is what I was looking at. And when Marley uh, obviously was going to continue, you know, I thought, okay, why not put together a team and try to actually insert ourselves into this area where... You're not coming in behind the fact, but you're there when it happens. And that has really paid off. Uh, we've been able to get a lot of uh, good video stills and, uh, and some recordings. And the really incredible thing is, I think, <clears throat> uh, since we talked, at least in the last two, two and a half years, um, the paranormal type activity has just gone nuts and uh, uh, so for the first time in all these years I started you know where you have to go where the data goes yeah and uh, that's where it was going and I started getting very credible reports from extremely credible people uh, that I totally trusted of paranormal activity and I'm talking about Pretty crazy stuff. Oh, and, you would bl- oh, yeah. Well, you would believe some of that stuff we run into. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I hope I, I hope I haven't related this the last time I was on. But there is an old, uh, what I call the old factory, and this thing was built on uh, the uh, foundation of an old uh, uh, Civil War home. And uh, about two, two and a half years ago, all of a sudden, at this, uh, this is a business. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the night crew started seeing shadow figures and uh, all kinds of, of really creepy stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, the, uh, the doors would start opening and closing. The lights would go off and on are just off for a long period of time. And they would see these shadow figures, uh, one of the best. Uh, they almost, an, a great number of them, and this is in still uh, daylight, right uh, after sunset, right before sunrise. And uh, they would see actually uh, humanoid sort of uh, shadow figures, a, a dark mass but with kind of a, a human-like form. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, but the the creepiest one. Uh, two of the people were working in there one night, and uh, they saw this <clears throat> this black form come through the outside wall, and they said it looked like a uh, sort of like a big turtle shell, and it just kind of dropped on the floor, and uh, suddenly they saw what were like two legs, front legs pop out. Two back legs pop out, and the thing leapt from uh, across a a 15-foot room, 10 foot up onto the opposite wall, and then went up to the ceiling, across the ceiling, dropped down to the floor, and went back out to the wall. And uh, uh, the people, it's it's really kind of funny uh, when you listen to the actual witnesses, because these are, are... good rural folks and they've not ever gone public with any of this and uh, so they're highly credible and uh, two brothers were working in the old building uh, one evening and one of the brothers uh, you know how you get that feeling something standing behind you yeah know it well yeah and but this this thing just kept getting closer and closer and closer And the guy who, you know, is a a coon hunter, I mean, he's used to being out at night, he's not afraid of the dark, Uh, it got to a point, he bolted 
through the front door, ran to his pickup truck, sat in there for uh, several minutes, and he knew he had to finish out the, the shift. So he drives the truck right up against the uh, front door, leaves the door of the truck open, and the front door open just in case he's got to go go out quickly. And this uh, whole process started up again, and he just dove through the front door into the front seat of his pickup and uh, threw a lot of gravel getting out of there. And, you know, I mean, and you listen to these people, there's no question uh, that this stuff is happening. And uh, one of the team members' uh, husband works there, and he has actually seen the same things. And he was an absolute skeptic. Uh, and the, uh, I hope I haven't told this Wait, hold on. before. One of the first events at this old building, there was uh, a 27-year-old gal working late. And about 9 o'clock in the evening, she suddenly is overwhelmed with... Uh, uh, sorrow, depression, uh, started crying. No reason whatsoever. And so she steps out the front door to try to catch her breath, and she sees a what looks like an enormous dark mass coming down, blocking out the stars, blocking out the uh, driveway, blocking everything out outside of the building, and the doors start opening and closing, the lights are going off and on, and, of course, she runs back into the building, and uh, she's trying to call her boyfriend to tell him that this is going on, phone's dead, and uh, so she runs into the back office room, and as she goes through the doorway... Standing six feet from her is a uh, tall uh, shadow figure with some kind of a hat. And she said a face more like an animal than a human. And uh, that was it, man. She, she bolted through the whole building. And uh, all of a sudden, everything stopped. The stars were visible. And her, dry, her uh, boyfriend is coming up the long drive uh, to pick her up. And that was the initial uh, event that I became aware of. Yeah. So, amazing stuff. That this is uh, very much like the, the Central Connecticut case we've been wearing. I mean, we get this stuff day in and day out. Uh, odd well, life forms seemingly bouncing around and this sort of thing. And Reynolds from Forest, two people are coming forward now, indicating, as you know, that the 1980. UFO landings and events were just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there are still people now receiving these codes and things, and uh, weird things happened to us when we were there. It's really amazing. You know, one thing you said, Ted, that really uh, piqued my interest, uh, everything you said piqued my interest, but uh, particularly the, the um, corresponding phenomena occurring from one place to another, uh, th- that is something we are just getting into with the, the sites that we're looking at. Can you give some examples of what is happened elsewhere and uh, some sort of a mirror phenomenon going on at Marley Woods, say? Well, it, uh, <clears throat> there, I know of uh, six different areas, and since you guys are starting to look into this, which I'm very happy to hear, um, into the ongoing uh, sites, uh, I'll have to send you, uh, uh, I can send you all the locations with the exception of Marley. Sure. And, uh, well, of course, you already have basically Skinwalker, but uh, there is a site in Romania uh, that I am just lusting to get to. Yeah, but, I've heard uh, of that one, too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. A, a totally wild uh, series of things going on there. But uh, there uh, is a farm in Colorado. Um, the, uh, let me see. I'll have to just pull up the others. Yeah, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll do one. You know, we can. Uh, we're certainly going to have you on more frequently than we have, uh, particularly because we certainly have the same interests here. Um, and another thing I wanted to know, Ted, too, was um, the the devices, light bulb devices you're describing. Do you mm-hmm. can you talk more about that? And can you can you express an opinion about what these might be? Well, the uh, the light bulbs have been seen uh, ranging in size from a couple of inches in diameter to uh, the size of a beach ball, typically baseball size. 
And uh, uh, a perfect example, one evening, uh, about 11 o'clock, uh, it's very difficult to get phone signals uh, in that area. It's so rural. And so there was there's one location where I can always get a signal. Well, 11 o'clock in the evening, uh, I walk out there uh, to, to give the wife a call. And I'm talking to her. And, of course, I didn't carry a camera with me, and I always carry a camera. But at any rate, I'm standing out there, and uh, I see coming through a grove of trees about 60 feet away two uh, light balls. And uh, they very much look like uh, a couple of headlights from an automobile in the early 30s. They weren't uh, extremely bright. They were about that diameter. They were about three feet apart. And they were uh, kind of a dingy white with a little bit of, uh, of yellow tinge. And uh, they did not illuminate the area in front of them, around them, below them, or anything. And uh, they're flying along, maintaining the same distance. And as they go through the grove of trees, all of a sudden the two bank and go around a large tree, maintaining the same distance from each other, and continue on. And so I'm thinking, well, they must be linked. And uh, a minute or so down the road, or the tree grove, uh, they go one on each side of a tree and then rejoin at that same distance. <laughs> and uh, they're flying due north. And the, the fascinating, fascinating thing to me is that these things had such smooth, perfect motion. And uh, no bobbing, no weaving, no anything. And uh, uh, just like a marble rolling on ice. And when they came out of the grove of trees, they made a turn, an abrupt turn to the left away from me. I could no longer see them and out over a field. And uh, the thing that really intrigued me was uh, the flight characteristics. And so I called uh, a friend of mine who's a meteorologist uh, some miles away. And uh, I said, what, what was the wind speed? Uh, and I gave him the location. And uh, he said, well, you were having wind gusts of 40 miles an hour. And, of course, I could feel that. And I'm thinking, how do they fly? in this smooth motion, head-on, into a uh, 20 to 40-mile-an-hour wind. And it's it was as though they were oblivious to the wind. Mm. And uh, uh, so, but as far as, as what these things are, the light balls, uh, I've developed a theory that they are monitoring something, um, Let's say they're kind of like our drones, uh, only a bit more advanced. And uh, uh, what it is they're monitoring, I don't know. Atmospherics, uh, I don't know. And uh, But I have found, I used to think if you're going to have any chance of seeing this stuff, you need to be very quiet, no lights, crawl in. Uh, and sneak up on this stuff. Well, yeah, much as the years have gone by, uh, I've found, for example, a family of four pull into a little cemetery there, and they leave the car lights on, the radios on, a lot of noise, four of them are talking, and the light bulb comes in, and they got all this on video, magnificent video, and it flops around, does all kinds of stuff for a while about 60 feet away, moves out of sight, and two come in uh, together. And uh, you can see a cloud-like structure that's constantly changing uh, form and color. And uh, these two stay very close together. They join, they separate, and they're about 40 feet from the people. So that was the starting point where I'm thinking, okay, are these things that curious? Um, about people, automobiles, and so on. And so I've started maintaining a much higher profile when I move into an area, and uh, it seems to be working. It's like they're curious. It's like they come in to observe you. 
Yeah, I found yeah. the same thing, uh, and, and it's interesting. Well, we're going to take a break right now, but we'll be, we'll be right back and continue this. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 AM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back with our guest, Ted Phillips. Stay with us. In times of joy. In moments of grief. We are there. When the world looks for truth, broadcasters come through, even when all else fails. Today, with more ways than ever to experience the moments that transform our lives, Americans still choose broadcast radio and television more than all other media combined. And our web and social sites are among the most visited sites in our daily lives. When important moments happen, both big and small. We're the first informers to history. We are the local broadcasters of radio and television, reaching more people, touching more lives. Brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. You can depend on us for public service, Owen Radio. And we're back, and I want to give you our phone numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me, our phone numbers again. Locally, 401-766-1240. And anywhere in the U.S. and Canada, 800-449-1240. If you'd like to speak with our guest, Ted Phillips, this evening, or ourselves. Now, uh, Ted, we were talking, of course, about Marley Woods and all the bizarre things that are happening there and a number of other places, and you speak considerably uh, more slowly than we do because you're from Missouri and we're from New England. So <laughs> we're still getting a lot said tonight. Um uh, my boy, it's amazing. These, what, what sometimes they're referred to as orbs, these these light light bulb kind of things, or mm-hmm. light ball sort of things. And um, you suggested a theory that I've heard before, but th- you you put it in such a credible manner that I think I'm going to really take a hard look at that. In our opinion, many of many of these orbs, they could be many different things. W- uh, when they're on camera. You know, they could be snowflakes or certainly dust or something or like this. Or moths, insects. And, uh, however, we've, uh, or at least I have had, I don't know about Ben, I have had situations where they have followed me, done, done very much the same things you've described. Uh, we hear about them in many areas. I find them, we find them in areas that we feel are thin places, as Native Americans might say, places where the, the boundaries of parallel worlds are very thin and they seem to feed around those areas. But the idea of them as monitors is a very good one. So, again, we'll sort of consider all that. But There's, then, also, there's also ideas that uh, so certain UFOs are actually living creatures in and of themselves. Yeah, and matter of fact, when uh, Ted was on last time, we uh, I think we got into that a bit. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was that was that with you, Ted? I wasn't sure, because I know we did it with somebody else. Well, Ted's the man for this stuff. I figured. So yeah. that would make sense that we did it with you. <laughs> well, that's it. So. All righty. So, well, you um, know... You've obviously, I mean, with the whole Marley Woods thing, I, I thought this was that was going to answer the next question. But um, what? Ah, I'll ask you anyway. What's the most remarkable UFO landing case you've ever encountered? Hmm, that's difficult. Uh, there are actually so many uh, in their own way that uh, are very excellent cases. Of course. Uh, I always have to think of uh, Socorro, New Mexico, and uh, that was the first uh, trace case, as a matter of fact, I investigated. And uh, I did it independently. Alan Hynek was there. Ray Stanford was there. The Lorenzans were there, but those were all in my future. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. It was a very, very uh, famous case. Oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, a very excellent case. I had the fortune of talking to uh, Lonnie Zamora on four different occasions. Now he was uh, the police officer who actually saw the landing, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, so extremely credible. And this guy, you know, he was not selling a story. And, uh, and the physical evidence greatly backed up uh, what he had uh, described. And, uh, of course, I, uh, one of my very favorites is the Delphos, Kansas, which uh, I pretty well talked to death. But uh, it, um, by the way, I did a book uh, called The, uh, the Delphos Landing, ah. a pretty unique title. And uh, 
I just got word from the uh, Fund for UFO Research that they're uh, uh, bringing out a new edition of that. Oh, well done. And it's uh, it's the most complete report. Uh, it has a lot of the analysis. And uh, uh, I had a call a couple of weeks ago from my old bud, Stan Friedman. Oh, yeah. Uh, we know Stan pretty well. Yeah. And uh, he said, hey, can you send me uh, a copy of this and this analysis sign? which I did, and the coolest thing in the conversation, I've known this guy for 40 years, and he basically, as you well know, is an E.T. Uh, person. Mm-hmm. I don't mean he's an E.T., but he's... Uh, <laughs> well, I've always wondered about Stan, though. He did like Reese's Pieces. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah he did like one. Reese's Pieces. <laughs> but, but anyway... Um, he is is a, a well grounded uh, scientist, mm-hmm. and uh, he began this this phone conversation with Ted. I am so pleased to hear that you're starting to look into the paranormal side of this stuff. And coming from Stan Friedman. You could have taken a feather to me, man. I yeah, mean, I know the was... feeling. He said that in the show one time, and uh, kind of surprised us. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I think I think a lot of people now are coming around to um, possible connections, and I go beyond possible. I mean, I'm convinced there are. Uh, uh, for example, one of the team members who is as solid a human being as, as I've ever known, um, her grandson was staying with her. Uh, she lives right at the edge of Marley and has had a couple of terrific sightings. And um, anyway, she's in the computer room, and her uh, seven-year-old uh, grandson is sitting on the sofa in the living room, and all of a sudden he starts the screaming and crying and, and all this. And she runs in the room, doesn't see anything, and he's shaking, and he's, he's absolutely terrified, crying. And uh, he said, did you see it? Did you see it? And she kept saying, what, what? And finally, she calmed him down enough. He said, a light. And she said, what did it look like? And he said, it was a round blue ball. And finally, when he was calmed down, he said it came down the hallway into the living room. And it was uh, moving directly at him. He stood up. And it reached a point about arm's length from his face, and he screamed, and it vanished. Wow. Now, the question is this. I have witnessed exactly the same sort of thing out over a field in Marley. And if it's flying over a field, it's a UFO. What is it if it's in a house? Is That's it a precisely UFO what we asked, the off? context. Yeah. 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 And... The line is becoming so thin. Um, so much of this activity interacts. And uh, you see what used to be the typical UFO as far as the smaller objects uh, now becoming or moving into the paranormal realm. Uh, or what we've always perceived as paranormal. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, right now I've been asked to investigate perhaps the the most active haunted house uh, in this country, maybe in the world, I don't know. But the witnesses, multiple witnesses uh, of the very highest caliber, uh, I can't identify them because of their uh, uh, positions, but... They call me, and uh, this is some distance uh, past Marley, and uh, they, in a group, went to this house, and they captured the clearest EVPs that you could ever imagine with just simple uh, voice recorders, Mm -hmm. no ghost hunting equipment. And they saw full-body apparitions and uh, uh, just about everything you can imagine, and uh, so one of the uh, individuals is the son of one of my team members, and he called her and he said, Mom, you and Ted got to come and check this out. And so then he contacted me, and uh, right now I'm setting up the 
I, I think I'll be going there uh, next week. And, well, we'd love uh, to hear about that. Uh, the the entire Connecticut situation with us. It started with uh, ghost reports in '05, and the woman called us because she read my book, Footsteps in the Attic, and said this multiverse thing is really the only thing that explains what's going on here. You know, legs mm-hmm. hanging from the ceiling and walking as though they're on a surface that's in you know, yes. somewhere else. That kind of thing. And it it has morphed into uh, <clears throat> it's still that sort of thing, but it's morphed into a UFO thing with. A, Military activity in a possible base, <laughs> you name it. Really? It's going, oh, yeah. Now, I'll fill you in off the air. Because oh, uh, I haven't really written about it yet, uh, except on the website. But in any case, uh, so we, we hear you, buddy. It's, uh, this, this is, uh, and the, the one of the theories we're going on here, and this has been extrapolated upon by several guests who are into the, uh, the whole 2012 business and the astronomical doings in the neighborhood in this particular period in history, which are very active electromagnetically, and uh, we wonder if perhaps these are doing funny things with space-time and worlds are blending, and as the natives say, the thin places are getting or more even, active. and so. Or even as simple as messing with everybody in general. Yeah, and that's all. But really, who knows it? But it, it is happening, and it's it's as John Keel might have said that the entire planet is haunted. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and you know, it uh, it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, I I question myself sometimes because uh, you know I've always dealt with stuff that you can pick up in your hand. And uh, uh, I've had somewhat of an interest uh, down through the years. Uh, I did see uh, a full-body apparition uh, as a young kid. Uh, that's That was the only thing that I'd seen up through the years. But uh, And I thought, well, I don't did I really see it. But I've had kind of an interest. And, you know, Alan Hynek was... Uh, was very much interested in the uh, paranormal. I never knew that. I oh, met yeah. him before he died, but we, we there wasn't much time to talk. Yeah, well, he didn't actually didn't talk much about no. No, that side didn't. of things publicly yeah. at all. Well, he didn't publicly, but uh, uh, when we would have uh, some free time, we I remember one time we were in Boston and we were waiting to do a TV show, and we had about four hours to kill and. Uh, he introduced me to uh, Eric Geller and really? uh, okay. Peter Herkos and people oh, like that I knew down Peter. through the yeah. years. And uh, so, you know, that was good enough for me. But I, when I was doing the physical trace stuff, uh, and we had so many reports coming in, uh, I would run into <clears throat> cases. Uh, involving uh, an object in daylight, an entire family, and physical traces. And then they go out and they're actually looking at the landing site and they walk back into the farmhouse. And for the first time ever, plates are flying off of shelves and they start seeing full-body apparitions. Yeah. And uh, immediately following this very close approach of UFO. And uh, <clears throat> and this was a metal device, or appeared to be metal, and uh, very close to the farmhouse and so on. So, uh, But I didn't have time to put the attention on that sort of stuff. And as a matter of fact, you know, when Heineken and Valet and Saunders and I did the uh, AIAA uh, uh, sciences meeting in California, we could not, we were invited to speak. But we could not mention humanoids. Really? Why and not? Uh, well, it was 1975, and That's this why. was all yeah. of the top scientists in the world. And uh, you know, I think back that you you couldn't even talk about some of the aspects of this stuff. And now look at what we're looking at. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, that kind of gets to uh, another point that uh, I wanted to raise, which is. Um, well, things things have definitely changed. Every, things change every day. But since the 1960s, how has UFO research changed? Well, it's of course changed greatly. Uh, the uh, you know we constantly say, guys, if we would have had the technologies that we have today back in the 60s and 70s and so on, uh, how much more we could have gotten done. But the in those days, uh, of course. 
Heine could put together the Invisible College, and uh, uh, which is a group of scientists and engineers uh, very quietly uh, applying science to UFO research. And uh, uh, I was one of the fortunate people in that group, and we uh, uh, had to be very careful uh, how we talked about this stuff because we wanted to keep it on a high level. And now the problem is, um, and we were actually out in the field investigating real cases, and now you've got a lot of people sitting in chairs in front of a computer uh, developing a lot of different ideas based on not a lot. Tell us about it. So, uh, you know, and I mean, I'm glad people are interested enough to uh, to put in the time, but uh, uh, you know, I noticed not so long ago uh, some dude tried to uh, knock down Squirrel, and uh, it was just a totally stupid uh, concoction. And obviously, the guy had not been there, had not talked to more, had not been on the site back in the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's easy to start tearing something apart uh, 40 years later when there's no one left to uh, to advocate for it. But, right. No, that's true. Um, I, I recall uh, after Alan Hynek died, I, I was in Great Depression because this guy was like a second father. And uh, with without Hynek around, it was different. And I basically dropped out of the whole thing for some period of time. And finally, uh, I had promised Alan that I would finish Delfo's report and publish it, so I did. And I, I started up again. And I remember getting an email from Jacques Vallée, and he said, Ted, I'm so pleased that you're, you're active, but I'm afraid you're going to be very disappointed in how things have gone. Yeah. So, and it is true. It is true. Oh, one bit of an aside here, and I want to give you a chance to talk about where people can get that. Um, but I don't know if you are our old friend here. We, we sit in the very uh, booth where uh, Joe Ferrier, uh, the former publisher of Probe Magazine, uh, the late Joe Ferrier, unfortunately, uh, was uh, uh, broadcasting his daily show from this station. And mm-hmm. he was a well-known UFO figure in the 1960s. I went, and Stan Friedman had, had known about him. I wonder if you had ever uh, heard of Joe. He had uh, a lot of famous photographs from Rhode Island that he took and uh, was a well-known figure around here. You know, I'm sorry. I I can't recall that name. I really oh, okay. can't. Well, no, no problem. He was a, yeah. a good friend of ours. But in any case, uh, can you give us examples, uh, Ted, of, of physical evidence that you might see or that you have collected? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, to me, the most interesting, um, <laughs> aside from uh, witnesses watching an eight-foot uh, ring form mm-hmm. underneath an object, uh, but uh, as far as uh, uh, a scientific look at the evidence, uh, the uh, landing pad imprints, and back in the day, um, these types of cases have almost stopped, and uh, I noticed statistically in the files uh, that began in the uh, uh, mid '80s, late '80s, into uh, the early '90s, and uh, the large, uh, larger metallic appearing objects that actually landed uh, were on the decrease, and the smaller uh, light ball activity was on the increase. Yeah, and that goes today, but. At any rate, uh, back in those days, uh, we were having uh, a, a credible high strangeness UFO landing with physical evidence every 36 hours. Wow! And that was at the uh, at the peak. And uh, but what I would find in the landing imprints, uh, not only could you see that they were configured in a way to keep the uh, the device resting on them perfectly uh, level with the ground, no matter the terrain. Uh, a lot of engineering in there, but the compression tests on the uh, foot pad imprints indicating an object of, uh, depending on the type of object, 12 to 14 tons. And uh, so, you know, uh, we're not talking about ghosts and goblins in those cases, mm-hmm. but 
Uh, and also, uh, I was able to uh, do compression on uh, several different uh, sets of footprints. And the object or the uh, humanoids were described as thin, three feet, three and a half feet tall. And the small uh, footprints uh, gave us a, a weight formulation of about 60 pounds. So, you know, that uh, basically confirms the uh, description. And I would point out as far as the humanoid cases, uh, at one point, 21% of the uh, 5,000 landings with traces involved little guys. And uh, about 96% of the humanoids in those cases were three feet, three and a half feet tall. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, there's a lot of statistics to, uh, I think, confirm uh, uh, facts. Well, you know, the physicality of this stuff is something that, or the material nature. Oh, right, people, yeah, 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 yeah. Like the like the, uh, the radiation poisoning people, stuff people get, like burns and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And we, well, we had Ed Fur on, Ed Fur, I believe, was pronounced on the show from Saskatchewan. Oh, yes, yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, he was, he was great. We, we spent an hour with him, uh, I think it was on our CBS edition, but he was, uh, absolutely fascinating. Nice, uh, oh, yeah. uh, type of person that you've described, very feet on the ground. Honest rural guy, and uh, it was absolutely fascinating his his experience with three discs on the ground in his own field and this sort of thing. Yeah, actually, I went up there and I spent two days with Edwin. No, oh, okay. Right after, right after it happened. There you go. Yeah. And oh, that's yeah, that's one of the top ten cases. I mm-hmm. mean, as far as the visual, uh, I mean, he was within fifteen feet of the near object. That's right. And uh, the other objects uh, extending on back. And uh, each of the objects leaving uh, very similar rings, compression rings, and uh, a great case, you know. And yeah. he was not even going to tell his mother that this happened. I mean, he was, uh, he, he just didn't want to talk about it. And his mom, I remember very well, I talked to her too, and she said, you know, I could tell something was wrong with Edwin. Something was bothering him, and she badgered him. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened? What what's going on? And he finally told her, and uh, it leaked out uh, through his sister's husband to the uh, press. And by the time I got there, there'd been an estimated four thousand people through the field. Oh yeah, well the Mounties had it too. They were involved. Yeah. Now the the uh, RCMP guy uh, Ron Morier. Um, I spent a lot of time with him, and he did everything right. He measured, he photographed, he had him roll a big tractor tire in there to see if they could replicate these kind of things. And uh, I'll never forget, he told me, he says, whatever came in, came out of the air, and it left the same way. Yeah, there you go. Well, again, the physicality, This I've had physical, people think these so-called ghosts and everything are, are you know, spirits, you know, but I've had physical altercations with poltergeists. I've been injured by them, and they were really? very physical, you know. Mm-hmm. So th- th- mm-hmm. there are commonalities here in at least the process that I think need to be looked at and finally yes. are. Yes. Yeah, so, all right, yeah. good. Well, I'm so glad to hear uh, that you guys are getting in uh, uh, to researching this stuff, and we need uh, really to... Uh, to exchange information. We will. Uh, I definitely. I'm excited now. And, and uh, of course, Ben will tell you I get excited easily. But, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> but this is a great conversation. And we'll, we'll, like, we'll be in touch off the air. And we're, we're going to. It's like finding where's Walt. Like, it's just like finding Waldo. Where's Waldo? <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yes. One of the things that's interesting, and we like to ask the reasons for things. Uh, and, and as you know, on the last show, we get a little bit into um, the notion of, of the. the Almost the translation of these things from metallic objects with landing gear and weight, you know, so many, so many tons and this sort of thing, into these light ball kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I mean, like look at Reynolds, the stuff that happened to Reynolds from Forest. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, you yes. don't know how you don't know half it. You don't remember when you have these shamanic things happening. What, what are you talking about? No, I'm, what happened? You I'm didn't talking, even get out of the parking lot. No, oh, you're uh, talking about the sightings. Yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. I'm not talking about but, when we were actually there. Well, I have patience with your old dad. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these uh, these these things do seem to be changing. What, why do you think this is occurring? You had speculated, I remember, that perhaps there's a different technology involved on the part of whoever's doing this, or what say you now? 
Well, you know, I tend I tend to go that way uh, still, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, you would expect some technological advancements over all these years, and uh, uh, what really I find interesting along this the same line, um, and uh, I hope I'm not repeating myself from the last show, but... Well, it's only uh, two years ago. I wouldn't worry too much about it. <laughs> All those folks are dead anyway. So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're talking to those that audience in a haunted house somewhere. Yeah, maybe. But, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if I can remember where I was going... Uh, Well, uh, going from from metal to light, yeah, the the technology probably changing. Yeah, what what I found with uh, the five thousand plus trace landing cases is uh, looking back and back and back and back, and uh, uh, I found a a strange line of uh, little humanoid guys dressed very strangely. And uh, uh, the case that brought me to that was in Italy in 1954. An excellent, excellent case. Well, then I found a case in 1917 almost identical as far as the object and the two little guys dressed weirdly. And then I found cases from 1917 on up into 1954 and it's they're so incredibly similar. And I started thinking, well, surely they would change your clothes and uh, and the type of vehicle and so on. And then the light bulb came on. Light bulb came on, and I thought, but what if they were all leaving on the same day? Well, that's that's precisely the question. I, boy, we could be twins. I, that's the same sort of questions that I would ask. Is we're dealing with different, possibly different laws of physics, different yeah. uh, well, just, understandings. Just popped into my head now, and I was like, why are all these little? Why is it always like little green men or time travelers or something? And I was like, wouldn't there be tons and tons of other like creatures that would be coming here by spaceship besides just those like four categories of things? Yeah, well, hence the ah. Excellent question, and uh, I was wanting a way to mention this. Uh, in the Marley Woods, <clears throat> uh, five years ago, I would not even talk about portals. And uh, in Marley, I have personally seen and videotaped a number, a number of times uh, a device that opens up over on uh, Site 3, and you can see it from Site 1. And generally, and this thing is so incredibly bright that when it hits maximum, it varies in brightness. When it hits maximum, it would actually shut down the light metering system on the video camera, which was eight tenths of a mile from it. Ted, and this it breaks have... my heart, but we're just about out of time. Oh very... no! Yeah, we have we have to make way for the uh, Boston Bruins and Toronto Maple Leafs here. But can you just very quickly give us your website, and can people get the book there? Well. The, uh, the book they would get from the uh, Fund for UFO uh, 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 Research, I think is what it's called. And uh, the uh, as far as contacting me right now, I don't have a website, but they can hit me on Facebook, and I'll be the Ted Phillips squatted down by a huge old English sheepdog. Okay, excellent. We're going to be in touch off the air. We're going to do this very soon again. Ted Phillips, excellent. thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Take care, guys. Thanks. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks for coming on. Uh, many thanks Bye. to our producer, Ben himself. We'll see you next week, May 20th, when we will do an open line show. You, you, I, we have like a minute and a half. Okay. Well, yeah, there's, no need to, there's no need to rush here. I won't <laughs> rush. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be like Ted and talk more slowly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you just need to relax. So right. on our CBS radio edition on Sunday, May 19th, we will welcome back retired British official Gary Hels- Hesseltine. I almost said Helstein. Hesseltine, <laughs> who will talk about UFOs and the police and also... Report on the citizen citizens' hearings on UFO disclosure in Washington, which he attended. Well, you're too busy thinking about hell the last few weeks. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Or I was thinking of Van Helsing. Right, that's it. So uh, stay tuned to uh, ON 1240 AM here and listen to the Boston Bruins-Toronto Maple Leafs hockey game. Uh, those poor bears can't seem to get those leaves off their back. They can't shake them, so we'll see what they can do tonight. So we'll leave you this evening with a quote from our old friend Albert Einstein. I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. 
So anyway, um, we will have Ted Phillips back very soon because uh, really, really great conversation. Yeah, it was it was really fun. I wish we had more time to talk. Of course, just as he gets into the good stuff, I asked like a good question. Three minutes before it ends, like, <laughs> well, our, our beloved station manager says, "Always want him leave, always leave him wanting more." So right on. So that's that it. that's Paul, you know. I'm Ben, you know. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.